Hi, I'm Dr. Lisa Porter. I'm a professor at the University of Windsor, and I am excited for my group to bring to you a snapshot of our research funded by the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada and made possible by the Mackenzie Rigg Brain Tumor Research Grant and Vikes Kit Cancer. Research takes a team, and this project is led by a passionate and talented research associate in my lab, Dr. Dorota Lubanska, and two brilliant young researchers that you're going to hear from in this video. Both Sammy Alshrad and Alan C. Sulaski competed their undergrad at the University of Windsor, working in my lab throughout their degree. Sammy is currently at the University of Ottawa in the MD program and has had a scholarship from the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada to complete this work in my lab during his first two summers. And Alan has just kicked off his graduate degree in my lab, already winning many top honors uh, to date. So take it away, team. Thank you, Lisa, for the kind introduction. So I think I have control over these now, but um, the title of the work that we're doing is exploring the role of the cancer activated microenvironment in the progression of glioblastoma, potential novel avenues for therapeutic intervention. So both Alan and I are studying the tumor microenvironment and we're taking a look at two different components within that microenvironment. So two different cells that live kind of in proximity to the tumor and communicate together with it. I don't think I have control of the slides unless it's just my laptop. Okay, thank you. Okay, so glioblastoma or GBM is the most aggressive type of brain tumor. It's associated with a very poor prognosis, which is around 15 months median survival, even with therapy. One of the major driving forces of this poor prognosis is the fact that GBM exhibits very high levels of genetic and phenotypic heterogeneity, which basically means that there's lots of variability between different tumors, but also within an individual tumor itself, which makes it really hard to target and treat because there's no uniform therapy. Currently, the standard of care involves surgical resection, if that's possible, and that's combined with radiation therapy and also with a chemotherapeutic drug known as temozolomide or TMZ. However, considering the poor prognosis, successful treatment obviously has some obstacles. And two of these major obstacles are one, heterogeneity, which I mentioned, and this is due to the existence of a subpopulation of cells called glioma stem cells. These cells provide um, therapy resistance, and they're also a source of tumor initiation and a big source of tumor recurrence. In addition to that, there's the existence of the tumor microenvironment, which in recent years has become more and more important, and we're starting to understand more about it. Essentially, there's a number of different cells that are in proximity to that tumor, and they all have their own little niche where they create signaling molecules that help regulate the overall behavior of that tumor. And it's, it's actually been shown to... Um, in a number of different cancers, specifically also in GBM, that these cells can promote aggression of the tumor. So one major component of the microenvironment is a type of cell called cancer-associated or cancer-activated fibroblasts, and I'm just going to refer to these as CAFs. It's been shown in a number of different cancers, mostly in pancreatic cancer and in breast cancer, that they play a role in this tumor progression that I mentioned. So one source of these CAFs is that you have a normal fibroblast and it actually receives activating signals from the tumor cells itself. And it undergoes this recruitment or this activation to become a CAF. There's lots of different biomarkers of these CAFs that you can use to try to identify the cell. But one of them that's really important, and it's been discussed in literature, is fibroblast activation protein alpha or FAP alpha. Um, this is a serine protease, which means it's a protein that cuts other proteins. And it's been shown to play a big role when it comes to extracellular matrix remodeling. And it has high levels of expression in a number of different cancers. Once this normal fibroblast becomes a calf, it essentially changes its phenotype or like what its functionality is. So it starts to secrete different products and these products become more geared towards promoting progression of that tumor through a number of different mechanisms like you can see in this little green box below. So for example, tumor proliferation, immunosuppression, therapy resistance, among a number um, of different other mechanisms. There's two specific components of the microenvironment that have been studied kind of extensively. And these are also upregulated um, when it comes to the secretome of CAFs. And these are hyaluronic acid and vinculin, which I'm not gonna go into too much detail on today, but they're just important to remember um, when it comes to CAF and tumor microenvironment biology. 
In terms of GBM, we've studied a number of different stromal cells, and there's a lot of research coming out, for example, on endothelial cells, which Alan will discuss later, but there's not as much data available when it comes to the role of CAFs, which is what my project is trying to better investigate. So I'm going to give a brief snapshot of what we've done so far to this date to understand the role of CAFs in GBM. The first thing that we did was we wanted to double check whether or not glioma cells could actually recruit fibroblasts like they were doing in other tumors. So we took two types of cells. We took a fibroblast cell line from a mouse and we took a glioma cell line, which is just brain tumor cells, also from mice. And we cultured them together in what you would call a co-culture model, which you can see here under that green triangle. And we took them and we did some analyses with them. Specifically, we did immunocytochemistry. So we looked at the regular tumor cells by themselves as a monoculture. We looked at the monoculture fibroblast, and then we looked at the co-culture where they were living together. And we looked at the expression levels of that fibroblast activation protein, which would be indicative of recruitment. So you can see in the first two panels, there's no red fluorescence, which is um, highlighting FAP. But in the co-culture, you can see that there's lots more red fluorescence in a bunch of different areas. And quantitatively to the right, you can see that there's high expression of FAP alpha, which implies recruitment from glioma cells. So that kind of confirmed that for us. Um, there was a number of different experiments that we did that we're not going to discuss today. But moving forward, we wanted to see what the opposite pole was. So we wanted to take a look at how these um, fat, uh, these calves were actually um, influencing glioma cells themselves. So we wanted to incorporate them into the microenvironment. And the way that we did this was by taking human glioma cells, human fibroblasts, and then putting them into this 3D model known as an organoid, um, which is a model that's much more representative of uh, physiology or kind of what goes on in the human body compared to 2D cultures. So what we did here first, uh, or honestly, the only experiment that I'm going to discuss using this model was we looked at the growth of the glioma cells over an eight day time span. And you can see in the images, both at two days and at eight days, that there's a much larger um, tumor mass or like tumor growth when it comes to co-cultured glioma cells. And you can see that quantitatively on the right as well. So what this was showing us was that fibroblasts were able to significantly enhance the growth of these glioma cells when they were living together with them. Okay, this was something that was just further corroborated by looking at other data. So as a cell cycle lab, we're obviously intrigued and in looking at some cell cycle profiles. So when we looked at the glioma culture, uh, glioma co-cultured cell profile, we could see that there was significantly increased activity at all stages of the cell cycle relative to the monocultured cells. And then to the right, you can see a proliferation assay, which similarly to the other data shows us that there's significantly more cell division in the co-cultured glioma cells relative to those monocultured ones. Okay, so it's been demonstrated in literature that the microenvironment can actually influence stem cell behavior. And as a cell cycle lab with interest in stem cell biology, we wanted to understand how calves themselves could influence glioma stem cell behavior. And specifically, we were interested in looking at um, kind of a mechanism known as uh, self-renewal capacity. So what we did was we took those monoculture and those co-culture glioma cells and and we put them into that same 3D matrix that I described before, but we did them um, in a model where they were introduced as a single cell. From that point, we wanted to see how many little tumor islands they grew, which we call tumorigenic foci. And you can see in the images, both at eight days and at 12 days, glioma cells that were co-cultured with fibroblasts had significantly more tumorigenic foci relative to the monocultured cells. And that's also quantified on the right here. So it tells us that calves are able to actually upregulate the capacity for self-renewal of glioma cells. One of the more recent things that we did was we wanted to better understand the aspect of therapy resistance. So as I'd mentioned in the beginning, the tumor microenvironment is important when it comes to therapy resistance and promoting tumor aggression. So we wanted to see if calves could do the same thing when it came to glioblastoma. What we did was we took that 3D model and um, we subjected it to the chemotherapeutic agent, temozolomide, and we compared growth of monoculture and co-culture glioma cells. So on the next graph, in green, you see the monoculture 
um, group, which actually dropped in terms of growth. They shrunk within that 48 hour time span. But here in the white speckled pattern, you can see the co-culture team of Zolomide, and they actually grew over that 48 hour time period. And on the right here, we just supported this notion of therapy resistance by proving that the co-cultured glioma cells had significantly more viable or more living cells relative to the monocultured ones in green. So our neat little collaboration that we have with Windsor Regional Hospital is that we receive actual glioblastoma tumor samples from real life patients. And we've used a published and validated protocol that allows us to not only extract that tumor and use the cells, but to actually isolate different types of cells. So we've been able to isolate the calves from the tumor initiating cells or those glioma stem cells that I described. There's an image here to the right that just shows the morphology of fibroblasts present with other glioma cells, but we're using a protocol that allows us to further isolate them. What we did here was we took the calves and we actually labeled, uh, sorry, we took the glioma stem cells and we labeled them with a red fluorophore. And then we took those labeled cells and we actually injected them into zebrafish embryos as a patient derived xenograft model. We injected it in a different kind of models. So if you're looking at the graph on the right, we did four different things. We injected the glioma cells that were labeled by themselves, or we injected them either with calves, with other cells of the microenvironment, or with everything in the microenvironment, including calves. So if you're looking at the panel of images now on the bottom, you can see on the top layer, there's just the solo injection of the glioma stem cells. And then on the bottom, it's the entire injection, including the whole microenvironment. You can see at both two days and five days post-injection, there's a significantly increased growth of that tumor, or there's a higher tumor burden in the um, co-injection model relative to that mono-injection model. And then looking at the graph, I just want to point out that in blue, you have the calves with the glioma stem cells. And you can see that even when you introduce calves by themselves, they're still able to significantly increase that tumor burden. So this is just a quick summary of all the work that we've been doing over the past two years, but I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Alan, who's going to discuss the role of endothelial cells in glioblastoma. Thank you, Sammy. So the finding that Sammy just mentioned is very consistent with recent literature describing crucial components, uh, cellular components of the tumor microenvironment namely endothelial cells, as Sammy mentioned. So what are endothelial cells? So endothelial cells are a type of cell in our body, and endothelial cells line all of the vasculature within our body. In cancer, the most well-known function of endothelial cells is the process of angiogenesis, where a tumor will recruit more blood vessels to itself as it grows larger to obtain adequate oxygen and nutrients. However, endothelial cells also play a role in blood clotting, and most importantly, in recent times in cancer, uh, they are responsible or have been shown to be responsible for the growth factor mediated regulation of the tumor microenvironment. So in GBM, it is thought that the endothelial cells interact with brain tumor initiating cells, or also known as glioma stem cells, as Sammy mentioned, and these cells are highly resistant to our current standard of care therapy for GBM and are thought to be responsible for the high rates of tumor occurrence that are seen in GBM. These brain tumor initiating cells, I'm not sure if you're able to see the right side of the slide due to the panel. However, these brain tumor initiating cells can be identified based on the presence of two proteins on their surface. You can think of these as antennae. So you have one of the proteins CD44 and the other one is CD133. We can sort these brain tumor initiating cells into these very specific populations, then pair them with endothelial cells in various models and study the growth and therapy response of GBM. Firstly, we wanted to see the impact of secreted factors from endothelial cells on the uh, populations of BTICs. So we used condition media for this. For condition media, we take the media that the BTICs are normally grown in. We place that onto a culture of endothelial cells for three days. 
and then we collect that media and place it back onto the populations of BTICs. Um, so anything that is secreted by the endothelial cells within those three days is now present in the media and can have an effect on the BTICs um, if that's the case. For this, we studied cell proliferation and the two populations, the one that only expresses CD44 and the population that expresses both CD44 and CD133 showed a significant decrease in cell proliferation over four days. Next, we observed that when we cultured our patient lines, so these are cells or BTICs that are not sorted into those populations I mentioned, they are known as heterogeneous. They have many different types of cells um, in a genetic sense. When they are exposed to conditioned media, there is a significant decrease in the number of spheres that these cells form because these cells normally grow in suspension as these nice round spheres. And also more of the cells began to attach to the bottom of the plate and acquire a unique structure, which is indicative of what is known as differentiation in biology, where a cell becomes more specialized for a specific function. And we wanted to then study the expression of specific genes that may be indicative of differentiation. On the left here, we have oleg 2 This marks oligodendrocytes, which is a type of cell that is more differentiated. And the subpopulation that expresses only CD44 showed an increase in this marker when exposed to condition media. Then we studied CDKN1B or P27. This is a tumor suppressor protein that is able to put a break on the cell cycle essentially if needed. And when cells undergo differentiation, they slow down their division rate. And so this marker is upregulated and we can see that in the population only expressing CD44, it is also upregulated. Lastly, we looked at MAP2, which is a protein found in neurons and neurons are very highly differentiated. They're very, very highly specialized for transmitting electrical signals throughout the body. And we saw that the population that only expresses CD44 also showed an increase in this marker when exposed to conditioned media. Lastly, we wanted to study the effects of the cell-to-cell -cell interactions between endothelial cells and BTICs and what effects that this interaction would then have on the cell cycle. For this, we used a Fuji cell cycle reporter. In this reporter, once it is introduced into the BTICs, we are able to tell what phase of the cell cycle, um, qualitatively tell what phase of the cell cycle the BTICs are in. So if the cell is red or orange, uh, it is in the G1 phase of the cell cycle. Yellow represents a transition from the G1 to the S phase. And then green is the G2M phase of the cell cycle where the cell will be actively dividing uh, to split into two daughter cells. We then use these cells to construct 3D organoid models. And some of these organoids had endothelial cells in the surrounding environment and others didn't. And those acted as the controls. And over 72 hours uh, in the organoids that contained endothelial cells, we saw a higher proportion of BTICs that were non-mitotic, meaning that they weren't in a prime position to um, actively divide at the moment, essentially. So in conclusion, um, normal fibroblasts within the tumor microenvironment of glioblastoma are recruited and activated by the GBM cells. And this results in an upregulation of FAP alpha and a downregulation of CD31. We demonstrated so far that patient derived cancer activated fibroblasts can actually augment um, tumor growth in an in vivo model in the zebra fish animal model um, when compared to GBM cells that are injected alone. And through the use of co-culture systems and organoids, we can study ECM remodeling, tumor growth and proliferation, stemness and self renewal, therapy resistance, and YKL40 expression, all of which we have um, made steps towards um, gathering data towards these processes and will continue to do so in the future. 
On the other hand, within the tumor microenvironment, we have endothelial cells. And uh, through our data so far, it is thought that the uh, population of BTSCs that only express CD44 recruit these endothelial cells, decrease the rate at which they divide. And this may be a mechanism of therapy resistance for this population as chemotherapy targets very rapidly dividing cells. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank the Rigged family and the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Uh, this project would not be possible without you. I'd like to thank Dr. Lisa Porter and Dr. Dorota Lubanska for their constant guidance throughout this project. Thank you to Dr. Elizabeth Fidalgo da Silva for her hard work and long hours in our flow cytometry department at the university. Thank you to Antonio Roy Azar for his bioinformatics analysis for this project and to all of our lab members for the day in and day out support and friendship. If you have any other, if you have any questions about this project, please email Sue Ripers uh, at braintumorfoundationofcanada.ca. Thank you.